What is up, Alex? I have so much energy going <laughs> up my spine. Oh uh, no, this is awesome. That intro fires me up uh, every time. Uh, well, we haven't we haven't done it in how long? A while. So I mean, we did it last week, but I mean, since then, yeah, I haven't like, lifted the intro in a long time. No, it's like ooh, I listen to bad. one of our podcasts and I always skip past the intro. Yeah, and go straight to and then like what you said the other day. I thought that was really interesting. That every ten minutes. What about every ten minutes? That's why I was uh, so. So here's what I did because you said you like listen to it every ten minutes oh, to kind of see yeah, how the audio. Because yes. we were trying to figure out our our um, until we got this board and all that stuff. We were having issues with the way we were setting stuff up and the editing yeah. and all that. <laughs> so we were we were checking. Yeah. So I so I thought, what if I went ten oh one, and then I went twenty oh two, and then I went thirty oh three. What what would it create a pattern? <laughs> I tried that on three different episodes. It's really interesting. Happen? Yeah. Well, that's how I write up our show descriptions. Oh, really? Yeah, because I go back and I, I listen to a chunk of this time, this time, and this time, and then I can understand the energy and the flow of it, and I know exactly what we were talking about. Oh, that makes and, sense. And here's the cool part. I'm not listening to all the details, so I'm essentially listening to a summary. So I just retype my summary. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's interesting. We need show notes from last mo- uh, week. Oh, yeah. We got to do that. Uh, last month. It's always... <laughs> These things fade in and out. I don't know if I'm, are you fading in and out? I don't know. Am I? Mine, mine keeps going like, maybe it's just, um, maybe, it's something maybe we need the intro. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm teasing. laughs> Remember we had the Chris Brown on there? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was on there. Yeah. It's probably I, I still there. It it's somewhere. We have lots of buttons. So, so guys, we're going to, we're going to do a lighthearted episode today. We're going to get kind of, I want to get a little historical cause I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's this great word and it is a word that people down through the centuries have always wanted to have, especially when you look at like, and we're going to get into Henry Ford built one in the Amazon jungles, but we're going to get a, um, we're going to get into each of these. But when you look at Hitler, um, what was the doctor that, uh, oh, what was his name? Don't say Kevorkian because he killed no, people. Oh, yeah, he killed people. This is opposite. <laughs> the one that went down to Brazil, South America. Um, I have his name. We'll go through that. But, yeah. um, and then, uh, uh, Frederick Nietzsche's, uh, sister, yep. um, tried to build one. What are we going to talk about today? Utopias. Yes. And then we're going to talk about our utopia, right? Yeah. Because I think, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the historical context of utopias and, you and I will talk about what our perspective of what we think our own utopia would be. Yeah. Mine, mine is probably not cool. You may, if you're easily offended, you may want to listen <laughs> to the historical part. And then when you get into my, what my perfect utopia would be is probably not what a lot of our audience is. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest, <laughs> but we may lose some listeners, Alex. <laughs> listen, if we lose listeners, then they weren't open to what people. Yeah. Are sometimes about. we just, and I, I want people to understand that um, we joke around a lot. A ton. And, and some of the things that we may say may seem to be non-PC, but there's a reason behind it because life can get so serious that oh, yeah. you're not having any fun. And I think Jesus laughed. They said Jesus was probably one of the most, you know, people that laughed all the time. He he made jokes. Relax. Um, He knew, you know, uh, according to the scriptures, he knew that he was going to die. Yeah. You know, and still, even at that point with knowing your death, he still took the time. Plus, you got to think if you're God in the flesh, you know, like the Christian um, and and you're having and you're perfect. Yeah. You you're without any sin and you're dealing with stupid morons. <laughs> you might as well just be like as <laughs> happy and giddy. And yeah, that's what they said that he was. What, but I mean, if any type of uh, a higher level um, being. You know, whether they're from higher density, (laughs) yes, any higher density um, being is, is I would figure that love and laughter would be at the top. Yeah. Love and love and laughter would be at the top understanding and enjoyment of this drama that is unfolding around you. Right. That's why I like comedy because I think it's so um, it's, it's, it's making fun of things that we take too serious. Yeah. You know, because we can get so wrapped up in everything. But at the end of the day, we're humans. Interesting point about comedy because people have a hard time speaking about something directly. Right. Because it gets too emotional and heated or like political as people call it. You know, so when you put it in a comedic sense, it gives everybody the opportunity to laugh at it. Because if they can make light of it, they don't have to directly talk about whatever that one thing is. Right. Yeah. It's like when a good comedian, you know, addresses issues. I I watched on YouTube. Um. Dave Chappelle just had 
He's, um, he, he is so timely, he kills it. Yeah, it, well, he had this new, you know, he, on his farm, he put in the six feet across, and he decided to make a, a special. Now, he got kind of more serious in it the whole time, you know, because he was talking um, to us all about, but but you knew who he was. Yeah. In every special that you've ever listened to him, whether you disagree with him or not or whatever, you know he's coming to you in pure honesty. And he's saying, you guys are taking this so serious to the point to where it's in all of us, you know, like whether, whether he's dealing with racial issues and he talks about the black, the white or whatever. And I love what um, Sam Harris, you've heard of him. Um, he, he's got a podcast and um, he has that uh, meditation app. That's number one. What, calm. Yeah. Or headspace or oh, something headspace. like that. Yeah. That's I think what that's what it is. Yeah. He said, he goes, imagine if we just a long time ago picked hair color. That's kind of the same thing. Yeah, like, why do we choose skin color? Yeah, yeah. He's like, like oh, oh I hate, you know, red hair. <laughs> I hate bunion footed people. Or, or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, that's you me. Know? <laughs> I hate people with, uh, I, don't but, know, I can't even think of anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he's like, it, it's the same thing. Whether you have different colored hair, you're naturally born with, you know, locks of love like you have or whatever. But you, if you really think about it, it's like you've chose one thing, skin, mm. you know, or you've chose blonde hair, blue eye. It, it, it doesn't matter. We're going to get into that with, yeah. you know, because Utopia and Germans were, <laughs> that was Utopias. the thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But when you, when you look at the word Utopia and we look at trying to build a perfect society with imperfect people, it fails. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's going to fail. And I think Utopia is relationship driven. Right. So if you're looking about building a utopia, unless people have perfect understandings of each other, then relationally that'll fail and people are the foundation of any society. So there's no chance of having a utopian society. People can't accept one another. You can't right. force uh, utopia can't be forced. That's the simplest way I can put it. And that's where most utopias when that you usually have one or two people that are making the decisions or a council or a group and then that's where it, the slippery slope happens for the for the sake of the commune. So we need fascism. to implement. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to the extreme of Jonestown, and, yeah. You know that was a utopia. That it was, was a utopia. And a lot of educated, super smart people went, and we're a part of that. It is, no, you're, and, you're and we right. can see. We can see. So I kind of want to get into before we get into the hor- historical aspects. I want to get into utopianism. And ideas put into practice. Cool. Let's talk about because I, I I think that right there. Before we get into the historical part, I think we can spend a few minutes on that. Thomas More coined the um, word utopia in fifteen sixteen word, and it it was the word means no place. Mm-hmm. Not so exi- that's like yeah. it doesn't exist. Right. It doesn't exist um, because when imperfect humans attempt, and we talked about this, personal, political, economic, and social, they usually fail. So I mean, whether the United States. I mean, we can talk about what's happening here in the United States. Is that was that a utopia? No, that was built. No, uh, I think because when we're looking at utopia here in its description, a lot of the issues with it have been the fact that it's strictly in a materialistic sense. First, they talk about the economic, right? Right. Those things that should not be the focus of the utopia. That's secondary to it. A utopia has to happen through relationships first between people. Right. If you don't have that, everything else that humans create will fail. Well, you have a dystopia. You have dystopia. Which is uh, failed social experiments, repressive political regimes, which we see that all the time. Everything feels more dystopian than anything else. Isn't it funny that the utopia can exist, but the dystopian societies are so prevalent? Yes. Why is something- Why why does it default to the negative? Why does it always default to the negative? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. The overbearing economic systems. I, if I remember, yeah, and if I remember correctly, did Thomas More was he killed by the king or put in jail? I don't remember. Yeah, I think he was killed by the king. Yeah, yeah I think he was like, you can't talk about that. Stuff. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and he, well, that's down through society. Anytime you got somebody that was, um, you know, you can you you saw the, what the Catholic Church did when the Bible was coming out. Sure, and it began to put into the English language. Yeah. You know, then all of a sudden the church or church of England, you know, Catholic, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whenever you start to disseminate information and give it the power to the people, guess what happens? The, 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 the that's where shuts down all the people that thought yes. they were in power. Which one of our sponsors, Tartle? Yeah. Is all about that. I really appreciate just giving power back to the people. That's what, <laughs> well, that's anytime what it I, is. Anytime I think power back to the people, I think turtle. Well, that's what it is. It's, yeah. a, it's a tool designed specifically for that. And how did they sign up so they can take their 
power back on their data? They go to turtle.co, T-A-R-T-L-E.co, and you're going to click on join now. In under 30 seconds, you can have yourself signed up, full digital wallet, and you can start implementing your data into the system. There we go. That was easy. And stop being a cog on a wheel. Don't be a cog on a wheel. You decide your own future. Don't let those people make decisions for you. Yeah. You make your own decisions about your own data. Whoever the hell they are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's probably capital T. Yeah. But isn't that funny? A hundred years ago and then now and how much data is worth. Oh man. And it's, what it's going to be worth a hundred years from now. It's increased. It's, it's increased dramatically. Imagine back in the, so consider data being valuable back then. Side right. note. Imagine if you had geological survey data for oil fields, but you're the only dude that had the map. Oh, Oh, think about how much that data is worth. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? So like, I mean, data was like, uh, they would send those guys out, you know, in the wild west and then make maps. And that was so valuable for building railroads and stuff. Yeah. And those guys, they paid them pennies and then they brought valuable information back because you don't want to be cutting through mountains if you don't have to. Or even the World War. Like, uh, go the first one. Go get yourself in a... Uh, what was people that made maps? What, there's a name for them. Cartographers. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I was thinking that, but, uh, you know, my brain. Yeah, I'm the, old. The, I'm almost the, a half century old. All the way back from Piri Risi, who did the first map of like... The Arctic and stuff. I don't want to get it. So go ahead. So let's talk about <laughs> no, this is a, this is a fun podcast. Yeah, no, we can, we can talk about maps. It's a podcast. Okay. So I'll talk about well, it real quick. This isn't uh, us having to be formal. So the remember when the Portuguese had like right. a phenomenal armada and they're like, we want to go be conquistadors and like, go figure out where the edge of the earth is. Find a, f- a better trade route. So why did, so uh, uh, you're going to continue this thought, <laughs> but this is interesting. The Portuguese always wanted to go out and everybody wanted to start utopians in Portugal. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't understand leaving? that. Why yeah. are you leaving? You know, and that's uh that was like a, the Freemason uh, hub was in Portugal. If you actually go back into yeah, history. And, and Nazis. Yeah. Ev- they Portugal. all wanted to go to Portugal because just because of its, its history and its relationship with like Mary Magdalene, you know, and Christianity and all those other things. So like it was like a, truths. so, so Hitler probably saw that too, because he was a spiritualist. He was, he was, he was a very esoteric person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a great word. Extremely esoteric, even right. though he was negatively oriented. Right. I'm not calling him a bad person. He was just negatively oriented. Right. Um, Let's clarify a bad person. Cause people are going to say, yeah, he was a bad person. What is, what is bad? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that is a perception. And somebody needs to go back and, and listen to our reincarnation. Yeah, we did two episodes on that, That's so correct. they can understand that. Yeah, if they that go statement back to it. needs to be understood through that. Yeah, you can, it, there's a difference between bad and, and negatively oriented, right? I'm talking about like poles on a magnet rather than just saying, "Oh, that's bad." Right. Well, I like the seafood. Just because it tastes bad to you doesn't mean it's bad to me. Right. You know, bad's not a good descriptor of it. Um, bad puts a judgment on something. Yeah. It's more of like a belief factor rather than an actual right. truth. And in and, and truth, what we perceive as truth in our three dimensional reality yeah. is not truth. Yeah, it's not because true. it's not, it, we've are, it's already been proven through physics and mathematics. Correct. That we are not in, <laughs> we are not in our, in our own reality. And we're not actually solid. We're, <laughs> no. We're just like fractal. We've even, together. even past that, they've gotten past the point of that. I mean, this will get into utopians. We even got past the point of that where, um, where they go back to Galileo or we go back to, you know, we go all the back to Einstein and we look, well, a lot of that theory has been debunked now with what are the little quarks and or, or, yeah, quarks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So now that they're looking into that quarks, gluons, all those. Things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now we've gotten down to that level and we're just made up of all these little random and they're then we buzzing. They're just buzzing around. Yeah. And <laughs> then we look at it and we just like, Oh, you know, we've got all these maps that are laid out in the universe and then they move and they shift, you know, yeah. according to, and then, you know, vibration comes out and that seems to be the language oh, that everything yeah, speaks that. Everything that we know that as of now, everything's speaking vibrationally, <laughs> but then we say, Oh, frequency. Well, how, do you, how do you create that, a music? That, <laughs> Wait, how do you create a music note? Yes. You exactly. vibrate something. Yes, so yes. everything's just one big song. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at the universe and we see that this frequency and this vibrations, and then we see that we're only looking at three of those dimensions of that. What about the fourth dimension? Yeah. And the, the fifth, fifth and the sixth and the seventh. I mean, they've already gone up to, <laughs> I think Eric Weinstein, I had 30 something dimensions. It's probably mathematically proven. There could be like an infinite amount of them. Our math that, is, that, that would be what I would perceive. That would probably make more sense. And our math is, you know, kind of rudimentary. But we're me. also perceiving it off of, what we know yes we don't perceive things in an infinitely 
infinitely infinite. Oh my God, that's tough. Infinitely infinite nature. Right. So our perception is already self-limiting. Yeah. And they're having to create new math to be able to handle some of the problems that they're having yeah. in these different dimensions. So yeah, it, it's, it, I think this is an onion or it's turtles all the way down. Well, maybe it wants to be an onion. Yeah. Maybe that's just what it is. And what's the onion do? You can take an onion, you can take it on, you can eat it and you can peel the layers or you can stick it right back in the ground and then it will regrow into itself and create a new onion. I, I, I thought of this the other night why I, when, I, when I had woke up in the middle of the night and stay I woke. thought of this. Yeah, stay woke. <laughs> and I had thought of this. If reincarnation is this ability to evolve and move forward mm-hmm. in different and, and in, what, in different mm-hmm. bodies that we're taking, in that here and now it looks solid. Yes. You know, like like here and now, you're Alex, I'm Jason, but I have, you know, hundreds of removed from me that did not look like me. Yeah. Did not have a beard. Maybe I was a woman, a kid, a dog, I don't know. Maybe you didn't have anything down there. But that, re- yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that reality in that moment, in that particular time, looked real. Jason, that's an excellent, excellent uh, So why would our universe thought. not be like reincarnation? Why wouldn't it? it what it the perceived thoughts would But this bounce. is what it does, because if reincarnation is a creational law, then your perspective is a creational law. And that means creation has to be doing the same thing. Otherwise creation would be hypocritical to itself. But what I'm saying is as, as we're creating, yeah, as we evolve, yes, then the law of physics, math and everything else has to evolve with that. It has to evolve at the same time because right. we're you, getting a deep because you are, <laughs> you are a piece of that greater whole. You, right. You're a fractal piece of spirit of the greater piece of creational energy, right. which is, which is, Eternal, which is absolutely eternal. Creation so, doesn't so, die. Yeah. So, it just what, is. What, so what laws is is eternal bound by? It's but not bound infinity. by infinity. Yeah. yeah. It's just it just infinitely creating. And so we're just going to come. Itself. Yeah. We're just going to come into more of that and an understanding of that, and then at the end we're going to say we could do math formulas for trillions of years, and we still we haven't even broke the beginning. You haven't even gotten to the beginning because you're albeit a small piece of something that's infinite. Right. So you'd have to infinitely do something. So it would take an infinite amount of time. So screw the math. Yeah. My dad was a a Baptist minister, you know, he passed away a few years back, but there was one thing that he said that I really, you know, liked, and we can have religious discussions, but I really enjoy it. He said, he would always tell me, Jason, eternity is if you would take a, um, a crow and he would fly from the farthest planet. He would take a grain of sand from the beach, just a small grain of sand. And he'd fly to the farthest planet and then he would come back and grab another grain of sand. He goes, when he got done removing all the grain of sand from the earth and flew it to that planet and then did all the other planets, then that would be the beginning start of eternity. That's how, you know, and he was using it as like for people to understand. It's it's a nice way to help conceptualize something that's non-conceivable. Yes, it is non-conceivable. Yeah. So why are we, whether it's utopians or whatever, why are we always trying to conceive everything? Why can't we just accept the non-conceivable? Because we do not like the fact of not being able to wrap our mind or our hands around something. We're so material. Isn't that, isn't that ego? It is ego. And we're so material right? that we want to control and form and understand this thing right? and really grasp it. But it's really hard to realize that you are just a piece. You have all of the traits, right? all of the traits of creation sit inside of you. All those natural laws flow through you. Everything you see and perceive is natural law. But understanding it on such a macrocosm scale, you are but the microcosm, right? So when you look at the greater whole of it, this thing moves on its own and it can't be controlled. So if you're looking at yourself and you're saying that I'm a piece of this energy and it can't be controlled, can I really control the evolution and the change that's happening within me? But don't you think mental illness comes from trying to control? Yeah, it is trying to control. It's that ego stepping in when it's really like, Everything about your nature and creation and the way the natural laws right. work, physics work, you're fighting it, but it's what allows you to operate. It's actually what's allowing you the ability to fight this thing. Right. So don't fight it. You're given the free will to do so through this, these creational laws. Then, then why do some of the most profound people that have created the most beautiful art, whether it's music or whatever, fight the most? Like, you know, they seem to be, you know, like you go to Picasso and you go to the museum and you look at all his blue paintings where he went to these dark, or you went through, you know, Nietzsche when he became uh, analistic, you know, after he lost all those relationships and stuff. Um, You know, it's almost like projecting in an artistic format. 
if they don't have the ability to internally handle these things, they're going to have to ma- compensate materially in the world outside of them in some sort of format. Right. And that creativity will shine through, even though they may have some sort of issues internally that's going on. So that eternal them. creativity is shining through and they're looking at it at the lens of what is the here and now. So they're feeling like they're different. Yes. When in actuality, it's eternity coming through them. And that you just need to let it flow. And if they would let it flow, they could change the world even more. Yeah. Like Beethoven. Yeah, there we go. That's High five. Yeah, that's like, great. like, no, like Beethoven, you know, like he would, he, he, he had mass amounts of depression, you know, they say. And, sure. And he was losing his hearing and, and he had to listen to the, you know, he had to put, you know, the vibrations of the, uh, you know, of his, I, I want to say keyboard, but I uh, guess it'd piano. be like piano or harpsichord. Or yeah, something. harpsichord. But um, when you look at that and then he created this amazing music that even now, you know, here it is 2020. And we still find that music beautiful. We can listen to it, you know. If if we, as you just said, mathematically, creation's like infinite, all these other things. Right. Well, then the creativity of creation is infinite. So the beauty that someone could create is also infinite if they just right. let it flow through them. But it's just, it's just interesting to me because whether you look at, um, you know, it's like some of the most beautiful people were the most troubled. Yeah. You know, and, and we'll get into that with the utopia because some people decided to make, you know, societies, but you look at, you know, like when you had, you know, the hippie movement coming out and you had this whole thing and there was communes, which are utopians, but then you had, um, like Jimi Hendrix just coming on the scene and just making amazing music, just stuff that would just like, you know, you're like, how could, I've never seen anybody do anything like this with a guitar. And he just comes up with this out of the blue, you know, and yeah. then, and then you turn around and you have uh Nirvana, you know, you have Kirk Cobain come on the scene and then there's this whole new music genre that's just created. But then you see the, it, it seems like there's just so much, you know, Janis Joplin. I mean, we could just name people left and right. And then I, I've always wondered, it's like, where did this trouble inside? Do you have to have that many ripples inside of themselves to create the creativity? Does there have to be that much darkness to create that much beauty? No, not at all. I think the beauty is helping them balance the darkness that may be inside of them. So is the darkness, they would have been completely lost. (laughs) Oh, check this out. (laughs) Is the darkness creating the creativity? No, no, no. If create the fight of the darkness, create the creativity darkness is a creature of creativity. So when you talked about the gold chariot last week, yes, and that balance, because mm-hmm. that's what I'm—that's what popped in my head, right? And the balance, and he's sitting there. The prince is sitting there, and he's seeing the good and the bad in the battle going on, and he's in the middle. Yeah, is that the middle? Is that where creativity stems from? That's where it comes from. And then every, and when you talk about like light and Dude, dark, weird. <laughs> and when you talk about light and dark, though, those are creatures of creation. If creation right. is infinite, right? Right. That, and it, that means. Everything has to come from that that's the spiritual energy, those natural laws. So that's where creativity comes from, is from spiritual energy. Right. So when you talk about the darkness in someone, that's not creating the creativity. Creativity precludes. It comes before the darkness. Because it's eternal. Yeah, it's eternal. But but darkness is, that, is very temporary. But so in the you know, in the Gita when you when he's sitting there in that golden chariot yeah. and you can't notice unless you have darkness, you can't see beauty though, right? Why, why would that be true? Because it's, it seems like... What is beauty? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Well, you're we talking, but then, because then if I can't see it... In our perceived reality. It's so So when we, look at, when we look at the here and the now, and we put time mm-hmm. as a... We put ourselves in a prison of time. Yes, we do. And we're in the jail cell. And then, so now we're sitting in this, you know, time frame, and we're Jimi Hendrix. Now we see the darkness that's inside of him, but we see all this beautiful creativity that you know, he revolutionized guitar playing. And we look at that all of a sudden there's this beauty that transcends that, you know, like here lately I've been listening to a lot of Motown, you know, and you see all the horrific things that happen to, you know, the temptations and all that, you know, and, and all the racism that stem from there. And then you hear these amazing voices and then, you know, there's alcohol issues and drug issues. And it's like, why does that much darkness have to be with that much perceived beauty? Yeah. And you know, you know why I think it shakes people up to realize that the beautiful has always been there, but they didn't see the value in it because all this darkness was plaguing the perspective. The beautiful, that create that creativity that was always there. I'm I'm, I'm tracking you always been there. Right. 
but they were so desensitized to it. They were so unaware within themselves internally, even if they were creating beautiful music, they were unaware of the true creative beauty, that expression coming from themselves because it was being plagued by all this other dark energy that they were bringing along with it. But you almost, you almost, you know, it's like the, when I always look at the yin and yang, you know, the black and the white, it's like, the, is it a balance of that? Is it sitting in that golden chariot? Just between? remember, everything's always in equilibrium. So it's like the chariot is on the line that divides both of the, the yin and the yang. That's what it is. But it's also, you know, it's the, the, the other polarized dot on the other side in the black, you have a white dot. Right. Well, there's also the light in the dark because you, dark you, the light. you don't have a hero's journey unless you have darkness. You don't have a warrior unless you have a war. Well, there's no journey if there's no evolution of consciousness. Right. Essentially, that's what it is. The spirit reincarnates because it wants to evolve its consciousness block. Right? So that evol- so, so that war or that darkness, what, what we perceive as darkness, is just evolving us to a higher level of consciousness. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's and there. It's, it's the lo- grit. It's a longer, more coarse process to right. go with that aggressive way, and you're going to live more lifetimes of killing people until you figure it out. Right. Or you can take a more straight and narrow path of, mm. let me perceive the beauty, understand it, understand the creational laws, and I'm going to follow through with those and evade all that, and I can fast track right. where I need to be going. Because you can always run, your ego doesn't like, but you can always run away from a fight. You don't, you don't have to, you don't fight. have to fight. What's the, all right. So let me, let me ask you something here. If we look at creation, the thing, everything that's inside of you comes from the universe. Right. Let's just look at that. Does the universe beat the shit out of you every day? Do you wake up and you just get like pummeled by hail and wind and a bird come out and just start mauling you? <laughs> right. You know, it could. does an asteroid hit you every right, day? Right. Yeah. Creation isn't designed to kill you. Then why do we why do we have such force against creation? Because why do we want to control it? We do not understand and accept it. People have not perceived creation for what it is. They don't look at the natural cyclical laws of everything that happens around them, and they don't internalize it. They don't realize that all these other things in the universe, these material things, <laughs> right, I'm have allowed this body to materialize. So we need to submit to these cyclic, S- this is cyclical things, right? Yeah. Submit to it by saying, I get it. I understand creation. Mm. And if I understand creation and its laws, I then understand myself because I am but a piece of creation. Creation does not beat the shit out of me. Creation does not murder people. Creation isn't racist. If creation was racist, right? Right. It wouldn't make black people. It right. wouldn't make white people. Right. It wouldn't make any other color of people. Yeah. Creation wouldn't be like, oh, I'm just going to choose this type of skin color. Yeah. And I also think that creation wouldn't have borders when does creation have a border do you see a border on space yeah every time they put a telescope a radio radio spectrum I mean, whatever it is going out to the the edge of the universe they can't even get to the edge yeah because there is no edge that edge is only a thousand intimate more millions more an edge is, edges an edge is an idea we yeah. have in ourselves to conceptualize again to put so we can say there's an edge to the universe and even name it yeah and and say how far it is and put mathematical equation of it's these many millions of miles this way to the left. And, and we can have, <laughs> cause we can use GPS and we can do all these things that are in our, but we're, what are we labeling in, in our, in, in our inferior minds, what we just did to that edge of the universe yeah. by putting we just shoved, this is what I'm getting to. We just shoved all of our ignorance, all of our ignorance that we ego. think that, that we is. think is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. We just shoved it on that edge, and then the universe is laughing at us because it's like, I have hundreds of millions of these edges. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what we're going to call it? We're going to call it the uh, ignorant ego edge. Yeah. The ignorant then, ego boundary. And, and then Russia can turn around and tell the United States that they got it to it first, and then we're going to argue back and forth. Do you know how many moons there are? Okay. If someone's going to argue over who owns land, did you create this land? I did know. you put it here? Yeah. Everything that your body... It is like chemically made out of. You right. had to ingest through the earth that was given to you from creation itself, this universe. You don't own that. No. If you own that, then I own you. You own me. I own all this part of creation. It owns all of us. So when you look at Elon Musk and you look at, at some of these, I, I, I've been studying a lot of AI scientists, you know, and some of these are, there's an East German guy I've been listening to and he's very philosophical and trying to figure out you know, our non-reality and where we're at and then looking at it, you know, cause, and I know you're in this space too, but 
why are we getting these super brilliant minds now? Like, I mean, have we always had, have we always had them through society? And, and I know, you know, like Buddha stepped on the scene, Jesus stepped on the scene and stuff like that. And we have our own theories and we don't need to get into that, you know, really heavily. And you can go back to our uh, raw podcast or get the books. Correct. Um, they explain a lot, you know, in that. But when whenever you see an Elon Musk or you see, uh, and I can't pronounce this guy, he's got a German name, but it just blows my mind the, how um, smart they are. And then how troubled they are at the same time. Consider this, Jason. Let's consider something very obvious. That a lot of people have come before them. Mm -hmm. And if they have studied the minds that have come before them, and if they're truly intelligent, they're not going to repeat the same process. They're going to elevate it. Right? Standing on the shoulder of giants. That's how people say, or good artists paint, great artists steal. Right. That's what you're seeing here. So that's why it looks so elevated because they've taken all this fantastic creativity before became aware to those perspectives. They're just becoming more aware and they're elevating. That's what's creating the genius to a higher awareness. Yes. Right. That makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 It's the more in our temporal uh, existence, when we see somebody that is just a little bit ahead of us and understanding creation, then we labeled the genius tag on them. Yeah. Is that how we do that? You know, what's interesting about that. I think, we internally feel that truth. Yes. Because we know that those thought forms are creational truths. Right. That it actually does coincide truthfully through obs- you know, observing what's going on. It's not us believing in something, it's us thinking for ourselves. And when I say that, it means we're perceiving what is absolutely happening around us. You know, this is supposed to be a funny podcast. I know. <laughs> I know. Dude, this is probably one of the heaviest podcasts <laughs> we've done. <laughs> oh, Lord. But, you know, if it's, <laughs> so that's what happens. It's an, it's, it's that elevation of awareness, right? Awareness of the self and awareness of everything else going on around that. Okay, so let's get into your perfect utopian. Holy crap. Before Can we, we talk into- about some history of it real <laughs> yes, quick? Yes, yeah. Let's get into some history here. This is interesting. So let me go to... Let's talk about people with elevated awarenesses that try to create a utopia. <laughs> and then don't become so elevated. Yeah. This is really interesting. So we had Brook Farm. That was here uh, in... Um, Brook Farm was found in 1841 in West Roxbury. Massachusetts. Do you know where that's at? Of course I do. <laughs> um, by Georgia and Sophia Ripley. Um, they had a 200-acre farm, and they had four buildings centered on the ideals of radical social reform and self-reliance. Mm-hmm. So they established free tuition in the community schools, one year's worth of room and board, and then the radiants were asked to complete 300 days of labor. Okay. So, um, you know, they had to be working in the manufacturing shops, farming, performing domestic chores, ground maintenance, um, you know, planning community recreation projects, stuff like that. Um, It lasted uh, for a total of two or three years. So (laughs) short time. (laughs) So here's what happened. So Ripley joined the unpopular Fourierism movement, which meant that soon the young people, yeah. yeah, which meant that the young people out of a sense of honor had to do all the dirty work. So young people had to repair the roads, clean the stables, slaughter the animals, you know, for eating and stuff. And so this caused, so all the old people are just chilling, relaxing. discrimination. Yeah. And then all the young people are doing all the dirty work while they're just, oh yeah, get get busy on that, you know? Um, So what do you think the young people decided to do? (laughs) All the work. What did the work decided to do? Stop working. (laughs) Yes. And leave. Yeah. (laughs) Nice utopia. Yes, yeah. And so then it just went down from here. Right, so that, um, but so in 1847, that's what yeah. really did them in was smallpox. Oh, yeah, that probably <laughs> weakened the whole uh, Yeah, that, that collapsed it. Yeah, so that was done there. All right, so our first thing was uh, ageism. Right. So ageism and smallpox, that shut down our first utopia. All right, let's go to the next one here. This um, is so here's another one, Fruitlands. It was called Fruitlands. I do like fruit. Um, it, was by, it was formed with the British reformist model. Um, and it was in Harvard, Massachusetts in 1843. The hell's so, going on in Massachusetts? <laughs> I know. There, most of them were. I think you had a lot of thinking there. Well, I, if you consider, yeah, high and we fingers. just came out of We just came out of um, creating the United States. Yeah, and then the Harvard's there as a university. So you have all those big thinkers saying, oh, what can we do different? Right. You know? So, th- so this guy, 
uh, that created this. He was he created out of the British reformist model. Charles Lane was his name. Um, and you, he was against ownership of property. Um, they were political anarchists. They believed in free love and were vegetarians. Sounds like my type of place. <laughs> I know. Yeah, this is why, that's why I, I picked come to New Mexico. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, so what happened to this guy? They were forbidden to eat meat. Yeah. Um, are using any animal products such as honey, wool, beeswax, or manure. Um, they were also not allowed to use animals for labor. And they it started to turn. Okay, they're a British reformist model. Mm -hmm. So then when you take an ideology and then you turn it into a doctrine and then you turn it into, guess what happens with this whole animal thing? Yeah. So like earthworms? Yeah. Now you can't disturb earthworms. Don't touch them. Yeah. So then, then they're becomes, part of... So dogmatic. It's the That was the issue that you find in Jainism. Steve Jobs? Right. Steve Jobs was a Jainist for some time. Made him very sick. Yes. Because... He only ate fruit, right? Yeah. And you can't walk on grass. You can't disturb bugs. Not, like nothing like that. So the diet like lacked a lot of things that he actually needed to put nutrients into That's his so body. funny because when you look at uh, when you look at how smart he was and, and amazing... And I mean, he revolutionized. I mean, the iPhone cannot be, there is nothing as important as that in our, in 50 years. Especially not in the United States. Yeah. You know, you have Huawei or whatever it's called. In Huawei. China. Huawei, Huawei yeah. you know. The government shield company in yeah. China. Um, so this was interesting. So they couldn't do any of that. They could, So they could only plant plants that would not disturb earthworms. So now you just, not only are you vegetarian, but now you just limited to only eating certain types of even then squash. You know. Yeah, like because it so, grows up above. Watermelons. So here's what here's what they could not, of course, provide enough food to sustain um, their members. Their diet they had some grains, um, a lot of fruit, you know, because fruits was also on there. Um, so they ended up getting sick, and then the whole, you know, you would probably have left after that. So if you were a yes, member of that in left. Harvard, yeah, you would have left. I'd be like, I'm going to be disturbing earthworms all day. <laughs> and then the community collapsed in January of 1844. <clears throat> now the big one, this is a big one. And, and this is in your neck of the woods too. Um, they came from Manchester, England, and then settled here. And you've probably heard of them. They used to live south of Manchester. Uh, the Shakers. Oh, yeah. So um, Shaker movement. They were officially known as the United Society of Believers in Christ's mm -hmm. Second Appearing. And they were founded in 1747. They came here with the Quaker movement because the Quakers happened. And then um, uh, Mother Ann Lee was their charismatic leader at the time. And they were called Shakers. They made amazing furniture. Um, and there's a whole, I they mean, if you look at Shaker. Good woodworkers. Yeah. Great woodworkers. But they were tired of the Quakers because the Quakers were being quiet and all that. And they were actually called Shakers because that's what they would do when they would religious get together. They would sing and shake. Yeah. Seriously, that's no, what I know that. Yeah, which a lot of uh, which is interesting to me, and I don't want to go down a rabbit trail. But the shaking part, animals do that whenever they have mass amounts of trauma, like after they almost get out of, uh, like you'll see an antelope, he almost gets bit by the tiger. The the first thing that this is why I believe in shaking, and I that they were onto something. Um, and I do this a lot. I'll shake a lot, you know, yeah, on purpose. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, and I, the reason I do that is because that's the first thing an animal does for their nervous system right after they almost die. So. When Anubis is taking a shit, my dog, he <laughs> shakes violently. Does that have anything to do? Well, yeah, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe because your dogs are vegan <laughs> and they're supposed to be fucking <laughs> eating meat constantly. Oh <laughs> that rabbit, oh, they, they should be eating two or three he's rabbits. Just, <laughs> yeah. he's, I'm like, are you okay? Uh, that's do you not funny. want me to look at you? <laughs> so uh, they were agriculturally based. So yep. a lot of uto utopians we see are agriculture based. Um, they also believed in common ownership of property. The big one was, and this is what kind of what screwed them over was they had to confess all their sins to each other. So uh, did you see that movie where you couldn't lie? Oh, I think it was man. like an English movie with, and I even, I'm trying to think who was on it. Uh, our guest, I mean, our, our guest, <laughs> our guest, everybody here, everybody here. <laughs> How many Hello. people do we have here? Everyone's yeah. chewing on popcorn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In spirit, yeah, our in guest. Spirit. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you, when you start thinking of confession of sins and then you're well, trying you, to create this open brain, you confess a sin though. That's like a hierarchy of then, then it means you have to absolve yourself to something that you say is higher than you. Right. 
Mm. Well, it, also it's like, you know, well, who do I confess to? And then what am I confessing about? And then do, and then, then your mind's going to play tricks. Like, should I, you know, here I was, you know, thinking about, you know, this guy's mom's hot. Do I want to, <laughs> do I want to talk about my <laughs> fetish with moms? You because know? I know she's going to hear about it. <laughs> yes. The yes and it's shake, yeah. It's going to shake from him all the way down to her. <laughs> exactly. So do I, I'll confess my sins and talk yeah. about the apple that I stole, but you know, out of the box, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to, you know, a lot, it's a slippery slope. I'm not going to rock the boat too yeah, much exactly, on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things was they called each other brothers and sisters. You know, that's what that's they, cool. and that's I like where that. we, yeah, I do like that. I do like that. Um, the, the, they believed in celibacy. So that was one of their problems. Cause when you're celibate, how are you going to grow your procreation? Yeah. <laughs> how are you going to grow your And cult? then the confession of sins and being celibate, you're, there's a lot of sexual sins going on. <laughs> you bet they are. And, and I, I doubt very many of them were told. No. Um, and so, uh, they had, so they had to do this. So they lived in gender segregated communal homes. So a hundred people would live in one, uh, large home and it would all be all males and all females. So that's, I mean, who wants to do oh, that? This is going to be a mess. I know. It's, that's the opposite of my utopian. That's like a bad <laughs> I, I would have a, a hundred women in one and just me. <laughs> and just you. <laughs> yeah. Ah, my utopia. Yeah, see, that would be my utopia. Yeah. Um, so they would have meet on Sundays, of course, and then they broke into spontaneous dance, and then that's what gave them the shaker label. Hmm. Um, they were pacifists, and this was the first time in the United States that the military and the United, uh, you know, and our country had to deal with when civil war broke out. They had to deal with conscious objectors. I like that. Yeah, I thought they, that was even they cool. had some interesting points, but they also had some like dogmatic principles that actually weakened right. their utopian ideas. The no, I liked it. Sharing of sins, right? Right, right. The people are separated into houses. They have no free will where they can live within that. The communal sharing of stuff's like totally fine. Like who cares? If you would have said the sharing, yeah, and not labeled it a sin, like a bad thing, yeah. Now we're talking transparency, and if I could share this with you, you know, share this information with you, and we're on an equal playing field. Thanks, Jason. And I can learn from this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Al. Yeah, teach, learn, learn, teach. Yeah, then now we're talking. Yeah. But now you're labeling it something bad that, that I have this impulse where I want to shag, you know, your mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, so I can't I'm talk shake about that it. shake that tree. <laughs> yes, yeah, the shakers. So the older ones died off. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, most of the communities were forced to close. Uh, and they, they lasted to the early 1900s. Good for them. And there was 19 communities. Because so, we saw there's some good things there. Solid principles, and they've lasted quite some time. Their furniture outlasted them in the Philadelphia Museum yes. of Art, so I'll give it to them. I like this one, Pullman's Capitalistic Utopia. This was located 15 miles south of Chicago in the town of Pullman. And it was founded in the 1880s by George Pullman. Uh, he was a luxury railway car fame. And he wanted yeah, to build cars. a, oh, yeah. yeah, he wanted to build a utopian community solely based on capitalism. It's not going to work. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and he said it was the best way to meet all material and spiritual needs. Capitalism was going to meet your spiritual needs. <laughs> Capitalism will never meet That's your what spiritual he said. needs. So according to Pullman's Creed, you can look this up. It's called Pullman's Creed. The community was built to provide Pullman's employees with a place where they could exercise proper moral values and where each resident had to adhere to the strict tenets of capitalism under the direction and leadership of who? Pullman. Mr. Pullman. <laughs> so what do we call this? <laughs> yes. Yes. His believing in capitalism, yeah. but uh, everything was run by him. His moral values. You had to live under Pullman's values. Well, how do I know Pullman's values are the right values? Why can't I, I think value things myself? If, if we have a listener from Pullman, I would like to know more information. So if please you let us live know. in Pullman, yes, Illinois, you got, you got to let us know. Yeah. Let me know. Yeah. I want to know about this. Uh, I want, I, Cause this one was actually interesting to me cause we are capitalist society, you know, that's interesting. So I'm going to solve my spiritual issues right. by being super materialistic. When's the last time that worked? And this is the only utopia that he said, Mr. Pullman, this is what I like about this dude. He said, we are a for profit basis. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> and get this, bro. The guy's unreal. The, the, no, the, the look at unreal. Mr. Pullman. Mr. Pullman in his law said that the town, his utopian town, had to return seven percent annually. Get out of here. Yes. What a strain. So this what was a, done. That guy's a tough. Yeah, this capitalist. was done by giving the employees two paychecks. So get this. One was for rent, which was automatically turned back into who? <laughs> 
<laughs> Mr. Pullman. Oh, Pullman, you genius, you dog. <laughs> and one for everything else. So you get two paychecks. One you get get back to me. I'm going to give you this, but it's for it's my It's going to make rent. you feel good, but I need to make sure I hit 7%. <laughs> yes, so yeah. I'm going to give you enough so that inflates my numbers. Yeah. Um, what happened with this capitalism, and this is interesting, is it created very rigid social class barriers. It does all the time. Look at what's going on right now yes. with us. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep this episode light. Okay. Continue. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I like that. So, so what, what does capitalism do with uh, social class barriers? When you look at materialism and capitalism, it creates hoarding, hoarding of assets. And hoarding mm. of assets automatically is going to drive people into their own sets of classism. I own more. I can acquire more. I know more than you. I have different opportunities than you. Immediate classism amongst people. I like that. Yeah. That's what happens with the material aspect. Short and simple. Yeah, so so with hoarding creates because um, I want to go to the spiritual aspect of this. With hoarding creates attachment, um, attachment, and then from attachment it creates scarcity. Yes, instead of abundance, it creates it creates scarcity instead of abundance, and then you're essentially saturating your spirit with you know material energy, which is the absolute polar opposite of what it wants. Yeah, so this one was a cool one too. This was sixteen twenty five to sixteen thirty. I love all these utopias. Yeah, so. Uh, so the United States uh, may have been totally different if this guy was allowed to get away with it. Thomas Morton. So Thomas Morton was with the Puritans of Plymouth, um, but he was hedonist, and he was a cider, cider swilling good time guy. Uh, cider that's what they call swilling him. <laughs> good time guy. That's what they called him. Yeah, my man. <laughs> yeah. So he 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 liked to get drunk, and he was a hedonist. So this is kind of cool. So in the 17th century. Um, in Massachusetts Bay, he would throw the largest and biggest parties. Really? Mm-hmm. He's like the gas. He was known for that. Bay. Yes, he was. Yeah. The partying had a higher utopian purpose, though, because he always dreamed of a liberated land. Um, he was a poet and a lawyer. <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> Did you imagine that guy uh, defending you in court? Yes. All right, Judge. Come on, let's crack open a bottle here. All right, let's get it done. So he wanted to call it Marymount. Um, it's what he wanted to call it, you know, cause I don't, I don't know why he wanted to call it Marymount, but that was his land, his utopian. And he wanted to be, his title was just the host. <laughs> this dude just loved the party. <laughs> We're going to call it Marymount. Oh, I'm just your yeah. host. I don't want to be in charge. I just want to make big parties. If you could bring me money, I'll throw the biggest parties. Can you imagine the Ragers? Yes. Oh th- yeah. This is perfect for, uh, <laughs> this would be perfect for somebody that wants to create EDM concerts. Oh, they they yeah. should use this. So Morton erected a pagan maypole. At Marymount, so this is so it's puritanical. So what did the Puritan, <laughs> what did the Puritans think about uh, a pagan a giant maypole? Pagan. Yeah. <laughs> so they arrested him. <laughs> of course they did. And then they sent him back to England. Oh, I thought they would have hung him in Boston. No, Common they like they sent else. him back to England and put him on trial. And in England, they didn't want to mess with it, so he's cleared of all charges. So guess what he did? What? He didn't learn his lesson. <laughs> he decides to return back to America. I'm going to party in another spot. <laughs> and he gets persecuted here, right? Oh, yeah. Good old So Puritan right when he per- gets back on the ground, they, you know, put, he, he had it. He should have stayed in England. He was understand. free. He had the best parties in Massachusetts. He could talk about how it was, you know, back in the day or create something in England or something. No, he has to come back here. Um, he immediately gets put sentence with charges. Um, and his houses that he had all in on Massachusetts Bay, everything he had, all his wealth, they burned it all down because of it was, you know, because it was pagan. So you have to burn it. You can't. <laughs> that's you, the only way to fix things. Yeah, that's the only burn way. it to the burn, ground. Burn witches, all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so America continued in its piranical ways where he had a dream and he wrote about this. He's a poet and lawyer of being egalitarian. Really? And that's what Mary Mount was about. That's what he wanted to do for people to be able to see. You know, I can picture this guy giving a sermon, goat skin leggings, yeah, he's pouring like the wine Joel, all over he's his like body. He's like the Joel Osteen of <laughs> <laughs> everything's positive. <laughs> everything's going to be okay, it's guys. Be Don't worry about it. Yeah, this was that guy. <laughs> you know what I love about him, though, um, and what the the Puritans called it, Anything associated with him, they didn't want anybody using his name, remembering any of his parties and everything, because it was the devil's indulgence. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and that's where we went from there on. After the after 1630, after he was killed and gone, we went back to our... But isn't that interesting in that little... We had a little sliver of excitement. I like that. Yeah. So 
Another one. Here we go. Founded by 1200, uh, the Scots on the Gulf of Darien in 1698. There was a place. The <laughs> Sorry, Scots. Are you, talking, are you talking about the Scottish and like a utopia? I yeah. mean, like they got to be naked. They're drinking mead. I don't know yeah, what they're yeah. doing. They called it Caledonia. Oh, I like the way that sounds. Yeah, doesn't that sound? Hmm. Now, I, I want you to know, Caledonia, this is an interesting story. I, I figured you'd love these because you like history, like right? This. I do. Caledonia was such a big utopia that it ended up bankrupting bankrupting Scotland and costing her independence. Get out of here. Yes, yeah. No lie. Here, so Tell um, me more. Panama Canal. Do you remember the Panama Canal? Yeah, of course I do. So who, it was William Patterson was the financial guru and the brains behind that. And they had a colony. They realized that establishing an overland route between the Atlantic and Pacific across the, it was it, like Isthmus, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, uh, Panama. It was. Yeah, so if they knew whoever controlled that would be extremely wealthy. Yes, correct. Yeah, so. The shortest route. So what he did is he went to the Scottish people and he said, if we can control this, we'll be extremely wealthy. We need to control <laughs> this. Sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> um, he could so, go to anybody in the world. Yeah, yeah. So, he's going to go to the Scots. Yes, yes, exactly. Isn't that crazy? And so they, people from Scotland ended up putting their literal life savings into trying to get the Panama Canal. Oh. And here's what happened. So they were all excited. The ventures, they set sail from the docks of Leith, I think is what they call it. Mm-hmm. First thing that hits? Hurricane. <laughs> Tropical diseases. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing that hits is Spanish. <laughs> Spanish flu? <laughs> no, Spanish Oh, the Spaniards. People. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they burn their colony to the ground. Oh, great. <laughs> um, so they're, now they're threatened. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they have nothing. All this money from Scotland is done. So the English had prohibited, they were smart. The English prohibited the colonies from trading with Caledonia. <laughs> Us English, bro. That is just oh, it's so out horrific. Of control. And so, because they wanted to assist with this downfall, that was their whole reasoning. Don't they it. always? Yeah. So the few survivors returned in disgrace, and England comes swoops in. So, you know what England did? They bridged the union between them and Scotland. Um, with an offer of compensation for those that lost money from all of this, which was a vast of the Scots. Um, and then from there, you saw what England and Scotland eventually so became. Scoop them up while they're yes. weak and emotionally yes. unstable. Yes, yeah, exactly. Classic. English, classic. Real classic. Nice. <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, imperialism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's imperialism at its finest. Yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, this is another one. Uh, Christmas Day, 1858, Marianne Gerling. Uh, she married a mother. Of two from Suffolk in the east of England, claimed she was visited by Jesus Christ. Irma Girling. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Irma Girling. And so Mormons are kind of a utopian, and they went and tried to build one in Salt Lake City. This is a little bit different. They're still lasting, though. I, I don't think they, you know, I mean, majority of that city is probably, um, and I don't know that much about them. I know it's I kind of a, a silly, them. but I know um, they were claimed that they seen angels and Jesus Christ and all that. Who was the, the people that started Mormonism? Oh, she. I don't know. I really know yeah. so little about him. I haven't even so, like treaded into Utah because. So she called her sect the children of God. Of course. You know, if Jesus visits her and she's the mother, you know, then these are her children, children okay. of God. Um, she believed that it was her mission to lead the children of God to the promised land. Where's the so, land? Yes. Utah. So here we go. Salt Which Lake turned City. out to be the new forest <laughs> in Southern England. Oh. She turned up there in the tiny village of Hordle uh, with more than a hundred dancing, shaking religious fanatics. So this is interesting. This is. You know, we see shaking again. Pagans. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> so she showed up and there were pagans in the woods. So this sect dwindled, and in 1886, Girling died of cancer. Oh, my God. And so then it was all done. <laughs> oh, my but, God. <laughs> um, get this. Bernard Foster was the school teacher that believed in this and the school teacher of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Stop. Yes. Stop. Let me read Bernard, that. I got, can I read that with Bernard, my own eyes? Bernard Foster, an anti Semite inspired by the, what is this? Supremacist. Yeah, supremacist notion of the German Volk. Are you kidding me? Which prized racial purity. So, him and his wife Elizabeth, which is Bernard Foster and Elizabeth, set from the fatherland to establish an Aryan paradise in the jungles of Paraguay. So, the Mormons were. The seeds that sowed Hitler. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we don't want to get into it too. I don't. Heavy, I'm, but I'm not. Just, I'm just. If you look re- at, I'm if just you, yeah, what you, you read. People need to. Okay, if you're in Mormonism, there's a lot of uh, 
it, there's a lot of books and a lot of documentaries that are out there. It's on Netflix and a lot of different places where people have broke free from that. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, um, when you look at, they believe that Satan was black and that black people oh, that's not fair. were uh, Joseph Smith and um, Campbell. What was the other guy's name? Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Was it Joseph Campbell? Yeah. Who was the other guy? Something uh, Smith, I think. I don't want to say it. That we, we, man, we need that Jamie, like what's, Rogan. What's Rogan has a Jamie. Now Does I know why there's a Jamie. he type up on the computer? Yeah, he types up on the computer. We need that. Yeah, we need the guy. Okay, that makes you look smarter, because now we're just sitting here like, uh. Look at these two idiots. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Crap. But they would just pull it up real quick and go, oh, yeah, yeah, those people. Yeah, so who, we could, you could just type in who started you know, Mormonism. Uh, we know this, but they believe, the Mormonism doctrines believe that Jesus was black and that black people were cursed from when Noah, because no, after the flood happened, uh, his one of his sons looked on him, Ham, looked on him in nakedness. And so they believed that he cursed Ham and made him black. And then Ham's descendants, because four descendants went and populated the world, you know, the, the uh, brothers and Ham went to Africa. Do you know how fucking insane that sounds? Yes. So <laughs> I'm good sorry. News. I'm sorry. It just sounds nuts. The jungles of Paraguay, they went, right? So guess what happened? The local animals. Insects. Oh, yeah, they got them good. Not the not the insects and animals did get them, but the microbes. <laughs> oh, really? Think about the jungles of Paraguay in the late 1800s and the oh, microbes. Yeah. They they were not used to new that. people. Yeah, and no. <laughs> Germans. You'd be a mess. Yeah, Germans. <laughs> um, yes. hanging up in the Rhineland. Um, and obviously the animals, the insects, and the microbes, they didn't listen to their Wagner. You know, or the German folk, because those insects showed no respect for them and their Aryan race. <laughs> they didn't care at all. No, the racial superiority, uh, they did, nature, those microbes did not nature care. did not care about racial superiority. No. Not so they, superior anymore, they huh? Went, <laughs> because you mentioned being on the jungle floor oh. and thinking that you're, that's your ego. We can go to this jungle and we're going to start a colony I'm gonna and eat. I'm superior and I'm superior above people and animals and everything. I'm going to eat anything I want. And here. then those monster bugs just coming in there and just, just wreck you. Wrecking you. Yeah. You're just screaming in your later hosens. So Bernard Forster uh, poisoned himself in a hotel in 1889. Elizabeth, Elizabeth returned home to Germany to look after her brother. Who was her brother? Frederick Nietzsche. <laughs> are you kidding? Yes. Are you kidding? How are the <laughs> and, Mormons so tied in with all this? And then Nueve Germania became part of Paraguay. So New New Germania, so New Germany. Yes. Became part and of then Paraguay. Auschwitz physician. Mengel? Yes. Passed through it while. Isn't Mengel the guy who yes. came up with the ideas of uh, gas uh, chambers? Yes, and all that stuff. Yep. So then he, and then he fled. You know, everybody thinks that, you know, what they know, he fled and then went down to the, yeah, he went yeah. down to that area. Can you, um, can chain of events here? Mm -hmm. Mormons want a utopia. They go to the southern part of England. No, 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 no. This is, so this I'm is setting. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I want to make sure we, we do our history. Can we back. have this clear? This is, this is setting up for what is going to happen um, with the Mormons. Oh. So we're setting up because this was 1600s, 1700s, and so then late 1800s. A group of people want to set up Utopia, yeah. go to Southern England, find yes. out there's a yes. bunch of pagans. Exactly. That doesn't work. Let's go to Paraguay. Yes. And then so the, the, that, the Mormons will come here in a second. So, and then when they're in, but they're all tied. And the Paraguay and Paraguay is a failure right. because you're not so superior. Right. Daddy dies. Poisons himself in a hotel. Mom goes back. Yeah, mom she, goes back to look after her brother. Her brother, who's Nietzsche. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Right. It's a whole bunch of literature. Now, but Paraguay still loved, Paraguay still loved the whole idea of, for some reason, I don't know why, and they had this Nueve Germany. Yeah. And that's where you see South America. You know, a lot of Nazis fled. You know, we know that even there's rumors that Adolf Hitler. Do you fled know who too. gave him their passports? Who? The Vatican. Oh, lovely. Oh, I love juicy oh, stuff lovely. like that. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. So. Uh, let's get into this a little bit more. Uh, this this one in Australia, mm -hmm. an Australian utopia. So Australia. Austra Australia is all criminals. You know they, that's how they started. England's it like get them stuff. get them away from us. So let's uh, let's see what type of Australian utopia <laughs> is here for all our Australian brothers and sisters. So here's what happened: a socialist. We know socialist utopians are uh, William Lane. He dreamed of better things. Okay. And he decided, this Australian dude decided to take off to, oh, 
Paraguay. <laughs> I don't know what's up with Why Paraguay. Why is everybody talking about Paraguay? <laughs> he took 220 fellow Australians, and he founded New Australia on socialistic principles there. Wow. But um, having lost 90% of its male population wards with Brazil and Uguaria, the Peruvian government was keen to help the Aussies out because they had no males. Uh, so, like, we need these guys. The Australian single men were even keener. <laughs> <laughs> Because the Paraguayan local ladies did not look like the Australian ladies, right? <laughs> now, Mr. Lane, William Lane, the head dude, was not cool with this at all. Because he was racist and he wanted new Australian Australian. He wanted to keep new Australia Australian. Oh, and he man. only wanted white Europeans. He ruined the fun for everybody. So he got mad and he left New Australia. See ya, And he founded another settlement named Cosme, and after that, didn't work out either. So he took off to New Zealand, uh, uh, all new land, where he resumed his career as a journalist and embraced pro-imperial conservatism. Oh, of course he did. <laughs> um, new Australia and Cosme were dissolved into Paraguay, because everybody's fucking each other. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and um, it, it created a new group of people, the Australian um, Paraguayans. Yeah, Paraguayans. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. That's amazing. So those, you know, those uh, 90% of the male population's gone. So 220 dudes show up. If I understand, everyone in Paraguay is really the descendants of a bunch of criminals from England. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Isn't this interesting? Oh, man. People My don't realize how many utopian yeah. <laughs> uh, things. Um, here's another one. Canada. There was a place called the Place of Harmony in Canada. Ooh, that already this is 1904. Good. That yeah. already sounds nice. Yes. Uh, and it was made up of Finnish inhabitants. So yeah. the Finnish people, yes. Uh, Very good skiers. They were good at fishing, being lumberjacks. And the problem was uh, this uh, was dominated. Um, there was no sea and forest very much <laughs> <laughs> where they decided to go. <laughs> um, so that's going to create some problems. <laughs> would you be like, why would you go near the coast? Canada has a lot of coasts. Yeah. So why would you go inland in a plain area? I'm an expert when you water could, skier. Yeah. And I'm going to New Mexico. <laughs> yes, exactly. That, you're gonna it's like when I see people that I'm own ex- boats. No, yeah, no, no, I'm a surfer. Yeah. And I'm going to move to Arizona. Oh, yeah. yeah good. Yeah. Nice. Smart. <laughs> but, you know, think about that. So, um, but this guy at the place of harmony, Caraca, he changed his name to Caraca. He had radical ideas about sex and raising children. Oh, tell me. He believed the father of a child should be a man who had not lived with the mother and that people who live with each other shouldn't have sex. So think about that. So this is interesting. This was his premise of so the whole utopia. Total so place of harmony, the place called place of harmony. Okay. The, the father of a child shouldn't be a man who had not lived with the mother. And that people who live with each other shouldn't have sex. Daddy's a stranger. And your birth parents have been shaken and bacon with other strangers in the street. Yes. Yeah, and you can only have sex with strangers. But if you decide to live together, you can't have sex and you got to raise a kid that's not yours. Right? So, despite that, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to you know what ruined their society? <laughs> Fire. No way. Yeah. It just burned down again? Burned down everything. How'd the Puritans get down to Paraguay? I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, this is actually 1919. In oh. September 1919, the Italian poet. And World War fighter pilot. Um, Gabriel, do you know Italian very well? No. Gabriel di Anunzio? Anunzio. Anunzio, yeah. Anunzio. World War I fighter pilot. Those guys were insane. Weren't we just talking about cartography? Yes. In the World War I, and then you yes. cut me off? Yes. Yeah, that's what it was. This, there this it is, is right there. Look. 1919, doubled. We came full circle. Italian poet. So he's a poet, and he's a World War I fighter ace pilot. This he guy's decides- a, he's an Italian Hemingway. This dude is awesome. Well, we're going to get into who was the other Italian dude later. <laughs> oh, Mussolini. Mussolini. Yeah, yeah, Mussolini. Uh, uh, we're going to get into Mussolini with this dude. This is really uh, exciting. Uh, isn't this? Yeah, do you really, like I'm stuff? I'm enjoying this. Like, <laughs> Nobody lot. dared to stop the poet warrior. And so for the next 15 months, within 15 months, it's almost like, what, a year and a half? He was the city's dictator. He declared him Italians like dictators. So yeah, I don't know why they, they he would go out that. every day. This is interesting. In 19, he would go out every day and people said that his speeches were the best they've ever heard. They were mystical. He's a poet. Yes. And he would, he would have groups of people, like thousands of people would come around every day and listen to his speeches from his balcony. 
Sounds for another Italian thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, Yelling at people from balconies. <laughs> yes. I think I've seen um, the Pope do that. And he uh, uh, he wanted groups of lovers. Like he wanted people to just love each other in groups. This is so Italian, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Group of lovers. A man who had his sons call him maestro rather than papa. Maestro. Yeah, they had to call him maestro. So <laughs> this dude's just so poet. So war one. A- I wonder if he was gay. He could hey, listen. He could have been. Yeah, he could have been. I mean, it doesn't matter. But I mean, it's like any if you say, "I want my sons to call me maestro," and I'm, we're all maybe not gay. He's just incredibly flamboyant. Yeah, that, that's what I'm. That's what I was I'm like wondering. Picturing and him with like if the he was scar, because you see a lot of you know and and the plane. you know all is one. So we have no. You just sent me the thing with Tartle. So yeah. you know, I mean, we make fun of all kinds of people or whatever. You know, and we'll say flamboyant, gay, whatever. But whenever, whenever you think about this, people that are gay and then try not to be gay, mm. it becomes like the worst. Um, situation that can happen, you know. So that's why I'm wondering if this guy, like Liberace, accept, you know, how many years or Rock Hudson, you know, and all that. And I know, unfortunately, society's put pressure on, you know, and that's horrific, and we can get into all that. Society's but he's got to freaking loosen its grip. He had a problem. Uh, Two things that he loved more than anything. <laughs> You'll never guess. Mm, <laughs> he's Italian. Coffee? No. Uh, pasta? Lobsters? He <laughs> ate lobsters every day and cocaine. No way. Yes. 1919. How flamboyant is this dude? Come on. <laughs> yes. And people said that he had thousands of lovers. So I don't know if they were all women or if he was just trying to figure but himself maybe he didn't out. Care. You know, or maybe he didn't care, which is great. You know, whatever. Caliglia. Or, um, so his followers were dressed in black uniforms, decorated with skull and crossbones. So like pirates. So Yale. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, one of the women of the time uh, that was very poetic, she gave him a holy dagger. What did he do with it? And in it was written, you know, he's a poet. So in it was written, so you may carve the word victory in the living flesh of our enemies. <laughs> Dude, okay. it's so Italian How does that dramatic. even scream utopia? I know, at yeah. All? <laughs> that sounds like a warmongering, flamboyant dictator. Yes, and look, good word. Look, look what this says. Read this. Hitler and Mussolini were both disciples of this gentleman. <laughs> you didn't know this stuff? No. <laughs> I'm glad I'm bringing up some good utopian stuff. That's a here. really interesting bridge. Yeah, of the poet. Yeah, they loved him. Um, but the problem was he wasn't good with government. So you ended up having thieves and a lot of super libertarian anarchists. And before long, you know, Rome was like, mm, we got to restore order. <laughs> <laughs> and they ended the pro fascist. Uh, what is that? Bacchanalian dream. Yeah. Bacchanalian. Yeah. Bacchanalian dream. Yeah. So that was done. Now this is my interest. This is, this is one that you're going to like, I think, cause it's industrial age, 1927. Okay. Um, Henry Ford. Never heard of him. Yes, he he made <laughs> Fordlandia. Yes, in the heart of the Amazon. Yes. So, Mister Henry Ford. What is with people going down to the Amazon? I know. There's well, there's a draw. I mean, we know the spiritual aspect of it. Or was it all the if gold? you? It, huh? All the gold. Yeah, it could have been that. His whole idea was to. Um, he knew that there was rubber there for his tires. Classic. Okay. You guys work and chop down the rubber trees. So what he wanted to do was build a Midwestern. This is funny, Mr. Ford. He wanted to build a Midwestern factory town in the heart of the Amazon jungle. So hundreds of miles of roads were built. No lie. This dude threw mass amount. Think of this. In the Amazon forest in 1927, hundreds of miles of roads are built. You tell me there's Henry Ford built roads. Yeah, and you can look this up. You can type in Fordlandia. And you're going to see factories, buildings all like broken in now. I mean, it's all gone, you know, and all this stuff. But they actually got it down there. Yes. He, he built factories and stuff. I'm impressed. Now, here's what, here's what he started fucking up on. Are you ready? <laughs> he wanted to socially engineer the environment. And he did it. He didn't go down there. Ford never visited the place. He just told people to go? So this is what he did. So first of all, Brazilian workers, he imposes diet restrictions. And we know what happens when you take South American diet restrictions. Oh, no. <laughs> That's their thing. Why? So they love food. It's, it's their Brazilian culture. people is what else do they love besides food? 
Bikinis? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We don't want to go there. Yeah. Drinking. Oh, they do. So he told them they can't drink. So they can't eat the food. He, he, you got diet restrictions and you can't drink. Then this is how screwed up people were in this those days. This is classic abusing people's free will. I know. And, and missionaries used to do this when they would go into, you know, different areas. I even, I even see that now where your churches will come into an area and then they try to make them like American churches. Yeah. It's like, if you go, if you, it's the funniest thing I saw when I was involved in um, ministry and all that stuff, they would go to the Philippines and find an Island and then they'd build a church building, you know, on a Philippine <laughs> Island, no air conditioning or anything. And then they're making them wear suits. That's great. <laughs> it's That's like, there's great. a reason why they wear flip flops and shorts <laughs> it's and, and there's a reason why they don't have, they have open air. <laughs> yes. We don't need to build a church building to no. say, yeah, because the buildings were everything. Um, this is what he would make them do, though. If they wanted to be a part of Fordlandia, they had to do traditional European dances like polkas in the waltz. <laughs> polkas? Yeah. They're polka dancing in the yes. Amazon rainforest. So guess what happened? It led to riots, knife fights, <laughs> and rebellion. <laughs> you cannot. Could you imagine the insanity if you showed up in the Amazon? <laughs> oh, my God. To Fordlandia? And to Fordlandia, they're doing the polka dance. Food, res- their diet restricted. Think about this. The complex ecosystem of the rainforest, and you want to build a Midwestern large-scale industrial <laughs> practice. <laughs> yeah, that'll do layer road right there. None of the latex from the Fordlandia trees were ever used in a Ford car. And the experiment ended in that utopia in 1927 ended. Let's go to 1965. Okay. Now we know hippie communes. Mm-hmm. And that's happening. It's the 60s, free love, all that stuff. Great. Love all that. Amazing music in that time frame. Oh, yeah. There was one called Drop City. It was in the rural south of Colorado, not far from us. And it was made up of dome-like structures. At this least is interesting, yeah. they knew exactly how to build their homes right. It was inspired by the design principles of Buckminster Fuller. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, these structures were made of everything from car roofs to the caps of Sprite bottles. Um, it was found on a seven-acre plot. Of land sounds by like, filmmakers and art students. Sounds like Taos, so New Mexico. Shit is not getting done. <laughs> it yes. Sounds like Taos. Yes, it sounds like Taos. The community aimed at egalitarianism was seen as being an act of rejection of life under American capitalism and the deeply unpopular. What war did we have in that time frame? Vietnam. What year was this? Yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam, yeah. 19th. Um, 60s. Yeah, Drop City, it was dropped. And then um, there was murders, and then biker gangs arrived there. And then what eventually happened to the Utopia was a cattle rancher bought them out. Why does this sound like Taos, New Mexico still? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the domes were taken down in the late 1990s. Wow. Um, so that's sad on that part. So I thought that was interesting. That was a really fun story. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. There is one in India that I wanted to, um, I mean, Jonestown, but everybody knows that. Everybody knows you can, that. I like the interesting yeah, ones you have. But there's, there's one in India that I didn't get very much information. It's still going. Um, and, but they said it's full of child molesters and stuff like that. That's, that's some rumors, Sounds but you can go utopian. there, you can go there now and they have huge domes and they have ecosystems inside of it. It's very well funded and you can go there now. I, um, I wish I had the notes. Um, it's like, uh, I think it's like happy land or something like Why that. Why are they going to give it a name like that? It's something like that, but there's a lot of issues in crime, but you can go there. You can get a ticket and go in. It's almost like amusement park, you know, and then it's all set up and they have residents. So you can be a part of it and Just all that tons stuff. Of child yeah. molesters. Yeah. That's what the rumors are. You know, with the, there was a lot of crime and stuff. It's in India. So, wow. Yeah. So utopians. That was the most insane episode I think we've ever done. From the heavy hitting beginning to this latter half, this show has been out of control. Well, that's what it was supposed to be, right? Yeah, I know. I like it. Really so fun. your utopian, Alex. What would my utopia be? Um, let's see. There is people go to school. Right. Of course, knowledge would be. Right. Knowledge is numero uno. Mm-hmm. And they're taught meditation and evolution of the spirit and creational laws. Wow, right. That sounds so like pure and good. Yeah. That's opposite of mine. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then when they get out, you know, here, this would be the utopia, right? Everybody is compensated equally for everything. Everyone's given two acres of land, a dome shaped house everywhere. And they have their own farm. Everyone's got free energy with a small cold fusion reactor on their farm. They have to self-sustain it themselves. 
And then when they go to work, they go to work for purpose and creativity, not to make a buck. So people are actually doing what they truly love to do. Well, that, that's inside of them. Yeah. See, I need to adopt some of my, your, you utopian. know, and then, you know, because when my utopian is more spiritual than material, mm. I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying that's just my, my preference towards it. Um, and also in my utopia, you know, the, the skies are more blue, no pollution. And everybody has a deep, deep understanding of the unity between all of us. Mm. That's my utopia where I could go outside and absolutely everyone will respect one another and understand who they are. Wow. Yeah. That seems like a perfect world. Yeah. Until humans get involved in that. Yeah. And then we just wreck it. So mine is I live on this huge, whether it be an Island or Montana, big acre. I live there. Classic. Yeah. I live there. Um, it is mine. <laughs> but okay, okay here we go. Leonidas. <laughs> so here, um, it has the largest library in the world. Ooh, yeah. So and there were the, the monies that would be brought to this would be to collect to make the library bigger and bigger. Now, now it could be in the form because I would want to collect old manuscripts oh, like and this. um and bring them into um modern thought and have machine learning. Oh, interesting! You're gonna to machine find, learn off of manuscripts. Yeah, from from I would want to take all the old and and, and put it into um, supercomputers, mm. and then find similarities and and produce data from all that. Oh, I love it! And then um, also from that data, I would invite you know because it's mine. Mm-hmm. So I would invite people would have to earn the right through their knowledge their ability to progress humankind. We would pick a topic every month and then um, I would have, this is almost like survivors or something, but I would have the top minds of that topic, like let's say world hunger. And then I would have the top people come in with the data that I have. And then we would, they would have to agree to be there for 30 days. And then we would come up with a solution in 30 days for world hunger and how much money does it cost? What can each country give? Very cool. You know, cause they already say world hunger is like, uh, you know, three, 300 billion or something like that. It's not that lot. It's not a lot, you know, clean water. You can do that, you know, very, well, and then you can maintain the, it. So cows, and then that would be given to United nations be given to that information would be assimilated and then given to world countries. And then they would be, imposed to act upon that data so they'd be forced to act upon that data yeah not because because you know you need countries and all that that's not going to solve anything it would be a large think tank that would be um that would come up with solutions oh, I like solutions. not identify problems but come, up, come with up with solutions and we would and i feel like history and and um i feel like we have everything that all the data that would be assimilated through history would if we could correlate it all, especially now with, with quantum computers and, and machine learning, that we could find answers. Well, that's yeah, honestly, you could. And then if we had AI working, um, and because I, I, I have a positive outlook on AI. I don't have, it, as, long oh, as, 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 as long as the military industrial complex doesn't get involved and oh, yeah. it's used for, but if it's, I feel like AI will solve our problems eventually in the future. Of course it will. It'll solve all material problems. Because it's just, it just can computate so fast. Yeah. Compared to, you know, machine learning more than, than AI, but um, being able to have these people in a room that where they're dedicated for 30 days straight, um, you know, and have all the smartest minds to me, that would be a perfect utopian. And then me just to sit there and listen. Oh, cool. Just to hear the, the, the talk back and forth would That's be, awesome. I, I would just be in love with that. You know, like to me, that would be the perfect world. Your think, your think tank. Yeah. So this is the elevated thought that I had on top of my utopia. was that, you know how you have the United Nations, but get rid of the political thing and just yes. make it like spiritual. Yes. And so they actually decide from a spiritual, non-dogmatic, non-political, non-religiosity sense right. how things are going to operate. And that is the absolute pinnacle of everything because they understand that the evolution of spirit and consciousness is numero uno. Yes. About but, politics, economics, and everything else. But the, my problem is, because I thought about this in my utopian, is when you take minds that are farther along, mm-hmm. you know, hundreds of, because there's minds that are, and I'm going to show you that AI guy I was talking about, because um, he's not from here. I guarantee you that. I love that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show you to him this. in three hours. I listened to this guy's podcast, and I've listened to it twice now. Wow. And, and this Eastern, he was raised in a utopia. 
Um, and he's one of the leading AI guys that are out now. And the things that he says is not from here. So, um, he disseminated information, you know, he was a nerd. No one liked him. Um, those type of people, you know, you take him and Elon Musk, all these different types of people, and they're in a safe environment where they can further human humanity without a nefarious power, Love you know, that. cause power is Correct. what power is what, but I feel now more than ever, there are smart minds. Like, I don't feel like Elon Musk is a bad guy. I don't think he has, I think he's troubled or whatever. And he talks about that, um, on podcasts, you know, I, I've heard him talk and he's like, you know, he just sold everything. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't want anything materialistic. He said, that's, 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 that's the materialistic stuff burdens me from thinking more creative because hey, people don't realize the solar company built Tesla. He built, I'm um, going to, it's not about going to Mars. It's the technology for having a goal. Yeah. It's the same with Tardo. Yeah. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with collecting all the world's data. It has nothing to do with that. The it, goal is the evolution of our consciousness. Yes, exactly. And our spirit, our understanding but you, but of you one need, another. You need a, for right now, gold. You know, there's, you to, to, why would you want to colonize Mars? It's like one of the worst planets ever. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, and there's gases <laughs> and it's, how hot is it? <laughs> yeah, like why would you want, or how cold is it in some yes, points? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, there's a lack of atmosphere, I guess. Yeah. So my utopian would be to take minds that, are not nefarious that don't have, and the group could kick a person out at any moment. Oh, there's a vote. Yeah. So there, there's a vote of, um, you know, like, so if, if, if you're, you, let's say you have a, we always pick on them. Let's say we have a Rothschild in the group. Uh, you should pick on him. <laughs> yes. And, you know, they're looking at world banking and they're looking at, you know, con loss of control. Mm. Maybe we address currency. Yeah, in be, one month. It'd be one that you And we talk about, yeah, we well, we'd have to. We talk about, you know, how will we get, of course, um, when we look at whether it's, uh, you know, Bitcoin or whatever, it doesn't matter. But we know um, with AI and the abilities that we have that currency moves quicker if it was a worldwide currency that was generated Absolutely. online. And we know um, with data packets moving and then you put a monetary value on that. We, and we've talked about that and I encourage people, they can go to turtle.co and read all about that and yeah. go on our YouTube. Cause we get heavily into that. If, if you guys geek out on that, but you take something like Bitcoin. Now you have a world banker sitting in there and he wants the structure, you know, of control. Not happening. So now that guy has to go. You got to vote Rothschild out or he needs to say, I, I am a Rothschild, but I'm against what, my dad did. My dad did. And let's reform this. And I'm like, fuck yeah, we forgive you, bro. Yeah, let's do it. Because yeah, forgiveness has to be. You have to have it. I don't, I don't care. If you're, if you're a smart mind and you were nefarious before and you're just like, I'm 65 and I want to change the world, you know, um, at the end of my life, perfect. Let's do this. You're going to have to stipulate then in your group the, the implementation of anything has to fall into these characteristics, mm -hmm. you know? Because what, what would, what would. Truth, equality. Uh, it's non-destructive, all these beautiful things. Because the AI needs to be controlled by the human heart. Yes. Remember, and, I and sent you that thing to minds that understand the AI. Right. Remember I, I sent you how the, the operating points of Tartle and our administration and our work and everything. What we tolerate, I mean, what we do not tolerate and things that we absolutely embody and champion, you know, and there was, I showed you that list and like, right. If you can design things and like your think tank is in that that other group of the things you embody and champion, you're not going to have any problems. No, and I I, th I think most people want good, and if somebody could say okay, like a Declaration of Independence, yeah, you know, like a Constitution where they could sign and say, this is helping humanity. Sure, this is my lasting document that I know between what the supercomputers did, what history taught us what we've come together as experts in this time, if we do this as a world, we can fix climate change. If oh, without, yeah. without politics, without borders, without countries, if we do this, if we do this, we can fix world hunger. If we do this, we can fix educational system. Sure. You know, and, and because what people don't realize is the world is acting in sync, whether we, whether there's a, a will to go to Harvard mm -hmm. or whether there's Singapore, the, the, these higher institutions is still there. You know what I mean? Right. And they're just, you know, MIT. I mean, how many smart minds have come out of MIT? Too many accounts. And then how many of them criticize MIT for trying to hold on to this, 
you know, 80 year old president. And <laughs> so when you, but, but these minds want a revolution. They do. And they need a place to do that. And a that's safe a place. Jason's utopia. That That's my utopia. Where he sits Amongst, at the top. There would probably be, yeah, yeah. No, no, I wouldn't sit at the top because uh, there would have to be like a, a Star Trek council. Oh, cool. Very <laughs> it would cool. look very Star Trek-y. I like it. <laughs> the buildings, like you talk about the buildings, oh, yeah. you know, for Tartle. Oh, I that, love that, that. I, I love all that stuff. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. So, what was the smart ones in Star Trek? Vulcans. Yeah, the Vulcans. It would have to be very Vulcan-like. Yeah, you have so many, sp- you have like 30 Spocks surrounding you. Yeah, which... At, Dude, you haven't seen my new Space Force shirt. Did huh. you see the did you see the logo that the United States came for? Yeah, it's got the It's Star helmet, Trek. Yeah, yeah. It's got like the webbed neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really neat looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I actually got an official Space Force shirt. That's yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So um this is interesting. How long do we go for? An hour and a half? This is gonna be two episodes. <laughs> it's gotta be. Uh, yeah. we'll have to split this up. Yeah, because yeah, we did two. Awesome. Um yeah. So if you want to hear the first part. Um, about our craziness with creativity. Yes. And then and then we'll go into history of utopians and then what are utopians. And then our utopias, yeah. So if somebody wants to learn more, they can go to hiredintoliving.com. I thought you were going to say Wikipedia about <laughs> utopias. And I was like, oh, yeah, wait, hiredintoliving.com. No, but what, what – it, so let's do this real quick. Mm-hmm. What is so beautiful about Wik, uh, Wikipedia? It's a dissemination of knowledge to anyone, anywhere on the internet. And, and anyone can contribute to it. Yes, that's the beautiful part about it. Mm-hmm. And and when AI gets involved with that, um, and can be able to have an AI have a voice, sure. As as a person, think about the contribution because it's assimilating and analyzing so much data, and then it writes. When we made law, the Supreme Court made law that said that an LLC, you know, a business is its own identity, a person, own entity. Yeah, that's right. I feel like we're going to have to do the same thing for AI. We're going to have to give it. Jason, uh, that is so forward thinking. <laughs> That's so forward thinking of you. Well, yeah. And honestly, there's no reason that you you shouldn't at that point. Because it needs rights and it needs to be protected. Yeah. If you have something that's handling a massive amount of information, making a <laughs> We're lot We're going of, on another rabbit trail. <laughs> a lot of decisions, you would have to put some sort of governing body around if, it. If you're going to have something that can be governed and be controlled by a person. Yeah. But then at the same time, watch to see if it's selfless. It's only selfless if we program it. To be yes. Selfless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, once these, if it's serving humanity and it's selfless, it has to be a person. I like it's that. Centen- it's a, what do you call it? Centenian being? Sentient. It's sentient. Then. Yeah. To me, I would value it just as you are. Are you and I am I? Well, I would value. I would also value it highly because it is a, not to be worshipped. No, not to be worshipped, but it, its value is high because it's so much input in its programming comes from human beings, right? Well, then it's just a collect. It's a collective of human thought designed. But this idea, them. like what 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 pisses me off, is this idea where companies just shut it off because something is wrong in its programming or it's not doing something Maybe that's what worries me everybody's worried about robots having rights and stuff like that what whatever i i'm more interested in this because it's a freaking robot it's yeah when, when, yeah when, whenever i look at an ai and then th- they'll spend 10 12 years in it and then they just decide to shut it off or they you know erase three years of it because it's going down if if it's granted to be a person and it has the ability, and AI should have the ability to learn from its mistakes if it's told that it's a mistake. Now you're talking about real artificial intelligence. Yeah, because most AI is dictated off of the way that our brain yeah. is. And so when we look at neuroscience and we look at AI and we look at neural links and we start getting into, it is the same. If it can, if it has some sort of input that I wouldn't say inflicts pain into itself, but has some sort of parameters that say, Doing this is not good for humans. Right. And the thing has to learn to itself, right? right? Has to have parameters where you can't do anything that hurts human beings, decreases their population, right. anything like that. Even if you you understand that overpopulation is an issue, you're not going to start making choices that say kill people, you right. know? And I think that would be a part of its program, but teaching it to learn. is Well, let me give you a prime example. And I know we're kind of going late, but this is really interesting. And you have mine, you have the mind far superior than mine. So let's take regenerative farming. I love now, regenerative now, farming. Now, regenerative farming. Now, we know uh, you're, 
you're vegan, I'm vegetarian, whatever, you know, I mean, I'll eat eggs and stuff you won't. Don't but, put me in a box, bro. Oh, I know, but I mean, you know what I I'm saying. What you had saying. some honey, you so time. all those vegans out there, Alex had honey. I don't give a shit. I'm going to have whatever I want. You know? <laughs> but but no, listen, Um, so whenever, when, so regenerative farming, so we got to look at the here and now. Okay. We know people are consuming cows, so we can't just tell people, this is like my think tank. My think tank would say, no cows, get rid of cows. Obvious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's obvious, methane and all that stuff. But you can't just but, shut but you that can't, water but pipe off. You can't, you can't just tell people that they're not going to eat cows anymore. So, okay, there's a part in regenerative farming where there's uh, the ability for cows to be able to produce back into the ground through their manure and all that stuff. And then they trample on and then you put grain after that. So how do we shift it into that model rather than shut it off? But you take a, there's an AI and we even have it here in Los Alamos um, where it can map the earth every what five minutes or 50 minutes or something like the that satellites we have up yeah there. yeah the satellites yeah. they can map the earth you could take an ai and say here's the parameters of regenerative farming here we want soil that's depleted and we want it to have 60 years of soil mm -hmm. we can do that in a, in a short amount of time we Very get smart. all these mathematical equations um here's the density of a cow here is the density of a pig here's, here's what chickens a, here's what a cow looks like on a satellite yes, camera yes, track exactly. them and tell us where they need to go so that we can get that soil. yes and then okay now we eliminate all this monocropping what happens with what happens when we eliminate monocropping what happens when we take all that land and we incentivize it through governments to do regenerative farming mm, cool. now what does that look like you know three 10 20 30 years from now yeah Th those are the type of things that an ai can do and that's why they need for me to get back to this that's why they need to be a person Because you can't, you can't, whenever you shut it off, you don't know what you're shutting off. You know what I mean? And, 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 and we would need to talk to an AI scientist and stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm way. So as, as, as assuming that it has some sort of neural learning. Which they do now. We know that. And you're saying if I shut it off, something that is artificially sentient. It's, I'm essentially shutting off. I feel like you're killing a being. I'm shutting off the consciousness of something, essentially. I feel like, uh, okay, so what is consciousness? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> is a thought? <laughs> yeah. But see, when we get into when we get into the AI and what it's created, it, it has, if it's thinking at its deepest level, does it have a soul? Is, is there those particles, those crystals and all that, that is making up of that? It, does it have the ability to learn where its origin is from? I think if it's if it's intelligent enough, it would know its origin comes from the people that are creating it. Yes, but it's it, but they, it, would, it would see it would see. It, we we have to think like an AI. An AI would see. Okay, it would go like this. These are the people that created me. Those people created these people. This happened. This happened. And then it's reading millions of of, of data of manuscripts, and it's saying, okay, now I get it. Here's all of mankind's history. This is this not these people. This is where I came from. Mm. So this, so I feel like it would be able to learn mistakes. You're right. Okay, I get it. And so, so then, then it would take the totality of people. Be, yeah, if it can learn a mistake. We always look at Ex Machiana and we think, oh, yeah. it manipulates us. Oh, or we see Terminator. Where is a movie that shows AI helping and assisting humankind? Uh, Rick and Morty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, that's so great, bro. <laughs> I think we should end on that. I, th I, don't, I think we could go down this AI rabbit hole for another hour. <laughs> oh, man. Rick and Morty is the answer. <laughs> Rick and Morty is the answer to everything. No. Oh, I love the one. There's one song on there. It's like... Uh, 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 he, all I do is like, he's like super wasted yeah. and he's like, uh, take off your pants, <laughs> shit on the floor. <laughs> let's get wasted. <laughs> get shwasty. Yeah. Shwasty. Yeah. Let's get shwasty in here. One of my favorite scenes is like, uh, Rick's like, my Morty, uh, Morty, you don't know what flat is. <laughs> and Morty's like, what are you talking about? And he goes out in the garage and he creates a one square foot panel of a perfectly flat frictionless surface. And the second Morty steps on it, <laughs> his mind like starts to melt and his like reality is like upside down. Oh man. Oh, that's funny. I do. That's just, I died. That's hilarious. I am sweating, bro. I am too. I think we did a podcast. We're like purging <laughs> ourselves. You know? Something's happening. Wow. Yeah, that was good. That was wild. One really hour and 34 that. minutes. That's about 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah. We'll turn these in too. Yeah.
Turn it one into two. Well, listen, anybody who made it through both of these, sincerely appreciate it. We'd love to hear your input on how you feel about AI from an emotional standpoint. And if somebody wants to tell us what their utopia is. Oh, I'd love that. I yeah, want to yeah, know yeah, what, yeah, you, yeah, what yeah. your utopia That'd is. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Message us in any sort of format. It doesn't matter. Send it over. And um, please like, share, subscribe. Yes. We'll be doing some real heavy um, emails. We'll be coming out here yep. real soon. We're going to step up the social media side of things to get more listeners. So we encourage you. But the number one thing that you can do is share this with others. That's right. Because That's why? The, we're not asking for anything. Higher density living will never... It's always going to be that information's provided. It's free for always you. Always free. The the only thing that we're asking is that you can help learn to each others. Yeah, help disseminate through learning and teaching, teaching, yes. learning. And that in our social media world is sharing. Yeah, that's why all is one. Yes. Thanks, Jason, Alex. Let's close it out.